India was once ahead of its time. Back in 1944, while most of the world hadn't even begun thinking about atomic energy, a visionary, Dr. Homi Jahangir Baba, was already laying the foundation for what could have been one of the world's most advanced nuclear programs. He established the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, marking the beginning of India's nuclear journey. Then came a series of milestones that placed India far ahead of its regional peers. In 1956, India entered the nuclear age with Apsara, Asia's first one megawatt test reactor, fully designed and built by India. Nuclear fuel came under a lease agreement with the UK, but the engineering? 100% Indian. By the early 1960s, we had Cyrus, our second reactor, developed with Canadian collaboration, enabling deep research into neutron science and isotope production. And then came the big leap. In 1969, India commissioned the Tarapur Atomic Power Station, TAPS-1 and TAPS-2, the first commercial nuclear power station, not just in India, but in all of Asia, built with U.S. support. These reactors went online, 22 years before China's first commercial plant. But fast forward to 2025, China operates 58 nuclear reactors with a combined capacity of over 57 gigawatts. India, just 24 reactors, producing 8.7 gigawatts, a modest 3% of our total electricity generation. So, what really happened? Why did India's early lead in atomic energy not translate into global dominance? Let's break it down. To harness India's vast thorium reserves and secure energy independence, the country laid out one of the most ambitious nuclear strategies in the world, the three-stage nuclear power program. At the heart of it was a powerful idea, a closed fuel cycle where nuclear fuel isn't wasted, but recycled, reused, and refined for maximum efficiency. And this wasn't just theory. In August 1965, just after commissioning the reactors at Tarapur, India began work on its next nuclear project, the Rajasthan Atomic Power Project Unit 1, and this time it was a pressurized heavy water reactor, or PHWR. This reactor was different, and in many ways it was revolutionary. Unlike the American-designed boiling water reactors at Tarapur, which depended on enriched uranium, the PHWR was tailor-made for India's reality. It ran on natural uranium, a huge advantage at a time when India didn't have enrichment technology and was already facing technology denials. Developed in collaboration with Canada, the PHWR became the cornerstone of India's nuclear strategy. Here's why it mattered. It allowed India to build indigenous capability using readily available fuel. It generated the plutonium needed for the second stage and it laid the foundation for a sustainable, long-term nuclear program designed for both energy security and scientific independence. Would any other country have taken such a bold bet on thorium? Let me know in the comments. India's momentum was building, but then came a moment that would shake everything. May 18, 1974, India conducted its first nuclear test. It was a moment of national pride of strategic assertion and of technological breakthrough, but it came with consequences. Canada, India's key collaborator in this project, abruptly severed ties. Technical assistance was withdrawn and the partnership was terminated overnight. As a result, India's flagship initiative the Rajasthan Atomic Power Plant Unit 2 was left in a state of uncertainty. For the Department of Atomic Energy, this wasn't just a diplomatic crisis, it was an engineering, logistical, and technological nightmare. Suddenly, everything had to be done indigenously. India lacked key components, documentation, 
and technical experience at the time. Yet, the Department of Atomic Energy rose to the occasion, and Rajasthan Atomic Power Plant Unit 2 was successfully constructed, commissioned, and operated by Indian scientists and engineers without foreign assistance. Yes, it took nearly 13 years from the start of construction to reach commercial operation. But in that time, India achieved something far greater. It proved that even without external support, it could finish what others had started. This was more than just a delay. It was the beginning of India's true journey toward nuclear self-reliance. By the late 1970s, one thing was clear. Foreign support had dried up. And if India wanted to build more nuclear power, we had to build it ourselves. That's when India took its boldest step forward. Unlike Tarapur and RAPP, Madras Atomic Power Station was entirely indigenously developed. But this was no plug-and-play project. Building a reactor from the ground up required engineering breakthroughs in zirconium metallurgy, heavy water production, and nuclear fuel fabrication. And because Indian industries had never before produced components at this level, everything had to be learned quickly. R&D labs became mini factories. Pilot scale processes were scaled into full industrial production. Engineers had to invent new quality assurance systems, train manufacturers in nuclear-grade precision, and ensure safety-matched global benchmarks, all without external hand-holding. Yes, the learning curve was steep. MAPS-1 took over 13 years to go commercial, and MAPS-2 came online in 1986. This wasn't just about delays. It was about laying the groundwork for a nuclear program India could own and sustain. The Madras Atomic Power Station was more than a milestone. It was proof that India could not only operate nuclear power plants, but design, construct, and commission them entirely on its own. That changed everything. As India gained confidence in its nuclear capabilities, it made a bold strategic move in 1988, signing a landmark agreement with the Soviet Union to construct two 1,000 megawatt VVER reactors at Kudankulam in Tamil Nadu. These pressurized water reactors would run on enriched uranium, offering a vital addition to India's power mix. The project symbolized a return to international collaboration, a new phase in India's nuclear journey. But history had other plans. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the deal crumbled with it. Russia was now struggling with its own internal chaos, faced mounting economic instability. At the same time, the nuclear suppliers group tightened restrictions, making reactor and fuel supply to India nearly impossible. The result? The Kudankulam project was put on hold. For nearly 14 years, India remained in limbo. Its ambitions stalled between diplomatic deadlock and technological dependence. Construction didn't begin until March 31, 2002. And that delay wasn't just measured in years. It was measured in lost generation capacity, unmet targets, and a growing demand that continued to outpace supply. Back in 1962, India passed the Atomic Energy Act, a bold move to protect nuclear sovereignty during the Cold War. It granted the central government and only the government, exclusive control over all nuclear activity. At the time, that made sense. It was about national security and keeping dangerous technology out of the wrong hands. But today, that legacy is holding us back. Unlike power, renewables, or even defense, where private players fuel innovation, India's nuclear sector remains off-limits. Only government-run bodies like NPCIL and Piavini can build, own, or operate nuclear plants. The Atomic Energy Act shuts the door on private investment. No new capital, no global partnerships, no public-private models that have transformed other sectors. Meanwhile, India already has what it needs to lead. 
world-class reactor designs, a highly trained workforce, and a roadmap to energy self-reliance. But without reform, that potential remains locked behind red tape. Unable to scale fast enough to meet India's growing energy demands and climate commitments. This isn't just outdated policy. It's a structural roadblock, quietly holding back one of India's most powerful technologies from powering the nation. The Atomic Energy Act wasn't the only hurdle. In 2010, India introduced another well-intentioned law, the Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage Act, or CLNDA, aimed at ensuring accountability and protecting the public in the event of a nuclear accident. It made sense on paper, but one clause changed everything. Section 17B gave the operator, typically NPCIL, the right to sue suppliers even after delivery, if an accident was later traced to a defect in their equipment or service. That's not how global nuclear liability works. Internationally, liability is channeled solely to the operator, ensuring simplicity and legal clarity. But India's law opened the door to open-ended post-sale legal risk, something international companies like Westinghouse, GE Hitachi, and Areva couldn't accept. The result? Deals collapsed, tech transfers froze, and suppliers walked away. To ease concerns, India launched the nuclear insurance pool in 2015 offering a risk cover worth 15 billion Indian rupees for suppliers. But the legal uncertainty still remained. CLNDA was meant to make nuclear energy safer. Instead, it spooked the very partners India needed to scale up. India's three-stage nuclear program was visionary. Rooted in long-term self-reliance, abundant thorium reserves, and the smart use of natural uranium. Stage 1 centered on pressurized heavy water reactors, or PHWRs, a technology we not only adopted, but perfected over time. But while India focused on PHWRs, the global nuclear landscape was moving in a different direction, toward the pressurized water reactor, or PWR. Today, PWRs are the most widely deployed reactor type in the world. They're standardized, efficient, and have become the global benchmark for civilian nuclear power. From the U.S. to France to China, PWRs form the backbone of large-scale nuclear generation. Yet India never developed its own indigenous PWR design. Instead, when PWRs were needed, such as in the case of the Kudankulam nuclear power plant, we had to rely on imported technologies like the Russian VVER. This wasn't a failure of capability, it was a strategic oversight. Had India pursued PWR development alongside PHWRs, we could have built parallel reactor streams, expanding our deployment flexibility, accelerating post-2008 capacity addition, and reducing our reliance on international vendors for critical designs and components. And now, the stakes are even higher. As the world moves rapidly toward small modular reactors, most of which are based on PWR technology, India's absence from the PWR development race puts us at a disadvantage. Without domestic experience in this widely adopted platform, entering the SMR market becomes slower, costlier, and less competitive. India can design, build, and commission nuclear reactors. We've proven that. But delivering them on time and within budget? That remains a challenge. Globally, nuclear plants take 6 to 10 years. In India, it often stretches to 12, 13, or more. It's not due to lack of expertise, but because of real-world complexities. Land acquisition, environmental clearances, and safety approvals often take years before the first concrete is poured. Then come design challenges. For example, in seismic design, India's regulator AERB doesn't provide standardized response spectra. Each site must conduct its own seismic study, 
leading to repeated design revisions for equipment and piping supports, delaying the process and complicating standardization. In contrast, countries like Russia include standardized response spectra in their regulatory codes, allowing designers to proceed without repeated iterations, saving time and enabling smoother fleet mode deployment. Projects like RAP7, CAP3, and CAP4 each took over a decade. And every added year means higher costs, delayed power, and locked capital. Meanwhile, renewables can be up and running in under two years. If nuclear is to scale, it must not only be safe, it must be fast. Because the future belongs to those who can build smart and build fast. While timelines have slipped and policy hurdles persist, one thing stands tall. India's nuclear journey is a story of resilience, self-reliance, and strategic progress, one reactor at a time. We've indigenized PHWRs, mastered heavy water technology, and taken bold steps with the Fast Breeder Reactor, a complex project that reflects our ambition and technical depth, even as it nears completion. But today, we're not walking alone. The world is watching. The future is modular. And India's moment is now. So what's next? Should India open its nuclear sector to private players? Should we fast-track SMR development? Share your thoughts in the comments. Your opinion fuels this channel. Like the video, share it with a fellow science enthusiast, and subscribe to TechnoWorks for more insightful stories.